Welcome back to Igneous Metamorphic Metrology. This is the second and final video lecture on metamorphic reactions. In the previous video, we discussed six types of reactions, polymorphic, exolution, continuous, ion exchange, redox, and dissolved species reactions. In this video, we'll explore solid state met transfer reactions and devolatilization reactions. Remember, reactions are always responsible for introducing or consuming mineral phases during metamorphism. In the field, we can identify when a reaction is taking place by relating them to the isograds, or the phase-in, phase-out lines. Therefore, if we understand reactions that produce minerals represented by the isograds, we can understand the physical conditions under which the reactions occur and the variables affecting them, and therefore better understand the metamorphic processes. We will review the various types of metamorphic reactions and discuss what controls them beyond this, the six we discussed in the previous lecture. Solid-solid net transfer reactions involve only solid materials of different compositions. Ions must therefore transfer between sites in the rock for the reaction to proceed. The four general steps of this type of reaction were outlined in Chapter 23, but for reference are given here. 1. Detachment of ions from the surface of the reacting minerals. 2. Diffusion of the material to the sites of the new mineral growth. 3. Nucleation of the new mineral, or minerals. and 4 growth of the new mineral or minerals. Net transfer reactions differ from solids, solids ion exchange reactions in that the process of net transfer reactions result in changes in the modal amounts of the phases involved. Several examples that you have encountered dur during your reading in the previous chapters in the book include the jadeite plus quartz equaling albite system, the encetite plus anorthite plagioclase equaling diopside and delucite system, and the orthopyroxene plus plagioclase equaling the garnet plus clinopyroxene plus quartz system. When diffusion becomes a limiting factor in these types of reactions, the reaction may become distressed as in coronaforming reactions as discussed in the textures chapter a few videos ago. If minerals contain volatiles, the volatiles must be conserved in the reaction so that no fluid phase is generated or consumed. For example, in the reaction of talc, plus encetite equaling anorthite. This reaction involves a hydrous phase, but conserves the H2O of the water. It may therefore be treated as a solid-solid net transfer reaction. Polymorphic transformations, exolution, and solid-solid net transfer reactions with, with little solid solution are relatively straightforward metamorphic reactions and are subject to variations in pressure and temperature without complications due to variations in rock or fluid compositions. The presence of reactants versus products has often been used in conjunction with experimental work that constrains the location of the reaction in the PTX space to set limits on the temperature and pressure conditions of the metamorphic event. When solid solution is limited, solid-solid net transfer reactions are considered discontinuous and tend to be univariant and run to completion as discussed in the previous video. As a result, there will be a, a, an abrupt change from the reactant assemblage to the product assemblage at the reaction isograd. All three of these types of reactions, polymorphic transformations, exolution, and solid-solid net transfer, are considered continuous when solid solution is pronounced and follows the criteria of a continuous reaction of those discussed in the previous video. Reactions that release or consume volatiles are among the most common reactions in metamorphism. Water and carbon dioxide are by far the most common, but any volatile species may be involved under the right circumstances. Because of the addition of the volatile phases, reactions are dependent not only on pressure, temperature, and composition of the rock, but also upon the partial pressure of the volatile components involved. Figure 26.2 is a pressure temperature phase diagram showing the equilibrium reaction curve for the reaction of muscovite plus quartz yielding potassium feldspar, an aluminum silicate, and an external fluid. The hydrous assemblage is always on the low pressure side of the curve, and the evolved fluid phase is liberated as temperature increases. The concave upward shape is characteristic of all devalorization equilibrium curves, at, especially at low pressures because of the slope, as determined by the Clapeyron equation is low at low pressures due to the high volume of the gas phase. 
The slope steepens quickly at high pressures because the gas is most, most easily compressed. Let's examine the reaction of a little, in a little more detail and change the partial pressure of the volatile phases. The reaction represents the disappearance of muscovite in a quartz dominant or a typical metapelite. It is considered to be the muscovite out isograd. The PT phase diagram shows the equilibrium reaction curve for the reaction. The red line represents the reaction where the partial pressure of the volatile phase, or PH2O in this case, is equal to the lithostatic pressure. This is a common assumption, and the red curve represents the typical shape of the equilibrium curve for a dehydration reaction. The hydrous phase is almost always on the low temperature side of the curve, and the evolved fluid phase is on the high temperature side of the curve, since it's being freed from the mineral structure. When we apply this to the Clapeyron's equation, which is dP over dt equals delta S over delta V, where P is pressure, T is temperature, S is entropy, and V is volume, we see the slope steepens with higher temperatures due to the high volume of the fluid phase at low pressures and compression of the volume of the fluid phase at higher pressures. Basically, this means that the volume of the fluid can occupy decreases much more rapidly than the entropy decreases as pressure increases. At very high pressures, the vapor becomes more compressed so that devolvization occurs, curves actually bend back towards themselves and obtain a negative slope that can theoretically close the loop upon itself. This brings us to why we did not discuss blue schist facies in the previous videos. The transition from green schist to blue schist facies at high pressure, low temperature facie series are unusual in that they require this loop to be stable and are distinguished by having hydrous phases on a high temperature side of the so that retrograde de dehydration occurs. If the rock continues to prograde to eclitoic facies, the reaction devolvalizes and becomes normal again. Suppose water is withdrawn from the system at some point on the water saturated equilibrium curve, where the partial pressure of the fluid, or water in this case, is less than the lithostatic pressure. According to the Lichier's principle, Removing water at equilibrium will be compensated by the reaction running to the right, thereby producing more water to compensate for the loss. This has the effect of stabilizing the right side of the reaction at the expense of the left side. So as water is withdrawn from the K feldspar plus sylmanite plus water field expands slightly to at the expense of the muscovite plus quartz field, and the reaction curve shifts towards the lower temperature. Figure 26.2 shows the calculated shift of the, of the partial pressure of the water for values of 0 0.08, 0 0.06, 0 0.04, 0 0.2, and 0.1 times the lithostatic pressure. The partial pressure of the water can become less than the partial the lithostatic pressure by either, of two, by either of two ways. One, the pressure of the fluid is less than the lithostatic pressure by drying out the rock and reducing the fluid content. Or, the fluid pressure equals the lithostatic pressure, but the water in the fluid can become more diluted by adding another fluid component, such as carbon dioxide or some volatile phase. In Figure 26.2, when we look at the calculated curves for the latter case on the basis of ideal water-carbon dioxide mixing. An important point arising from figure 26.2 is this. The temperature of the isograd based on the devolvization reaction is sensitive to the partial pressure of the volatile species involved. An alternative is the temperature, temperature composition of the fluid phase diagram. Because water and carbon dioxide are by far the most common metamorphic volatiles, the X and the TX diagrams usually is the mole fraction of carbon dioxide or water in the H2O CO2 mixture. Because pressure is also a common variable, a TX fluid diagram must be created for a specific set of pressure conditions. Figure 26.4 is a T temperature composition water 
diagram for the reaction 26.5 in your book, in which the lithostatic pressure is 0.5 gigapascals. Because water and CO2 are the most common volatile phases in the metamorphic reactions, the X in this diagram is representing the mole fraction of CO2 in the H2O CO2 mixture. As a result, you can calculate the composition, X, of the CO2 by looking at the composition of the number of moles of CO2 over the total moles of CO2 plus water, where N is the number of moles or mo molecules in each fluid species. The temperature composition fluid diagram, though, can be created for any fluid species desired. The most common diagram used uses temperature on the y-axis and composition of the fluid on the x-axis and sets the diagram for a specific pressure. The dots connected with the blue lines in figure 26.4 correspond to the dashed lines in figure 26.2 since the water pressure plus the carbon dioxide pressure is going to be equal to the lithostatic pressure and ideal mixing assumes the water pressure is equal to water composition times lithostatic pressure. Once the equilibrium curve is plotted on figure 26.4, it is easy to label the fields by remembering that the hydrous phase mineral phases is stable at the low temperature and the volatile phase is liberated as high as temperature increases. It is of note that it is also possible to determine the maximum stability temperature of a hydrous mineral assemblage is pure water because this is the maximum water pressure possible at the pressure specified, and we can imagine optimal water being forced into hydrous muscovite enhancing the mineral stability. At low water pressures, there is little water pressure, so muscovite breaks down quickly, and hydrous phases is not stable in an absolutely volatile free environment, and the curve becomes asymptotic at low pressures, never reaching X H2O equaling zero. The shape of all dehydration curves on the TX fluid diagrams are similar to the curves in figure 26.4. Maximum temperature at the pure water end and the slope gently and slope gently at the high XH2O, but steeper towards low H2O, becoming near vertical at very low H XH2O. Reaction temperatures can thus be pr practically any temperature below the maximum water pressure equaling lithostatic pressure. For most reactions, the reaction temperature varies less than 200 degrees centigrade. Nonetheless, one must take great care to constrain the fluid compositions, if at all possible, before using a devolatilization reaction to indicate metamorphic grade. Decarbonation reactions can be treated in an identical fashion. For example, the reaction of calcite plus quartz equaling quartz plus melastonite, or figure tw equation 26.26 in your book, can also be shown on the TCO2 composition diagram. The temperature of the melastonite in isograd is based on this reaction, obviously depends upon the pressure of the carbon dioxide in the same way the previous example depended on the pressure of the H2O. The reaction has the same form as reaction 26.5 only the maximum thermal stability of the carbonate mineral assemblage occurs at the pure CO2. In his theoretical and experimental study of the magnesium, silica, water, CO2 system, Greenwood in 1967 distinguished five principal types of equilibria involving the CO2 H2O fluids. Each type has its own character shape based on the, the TX fluid diagram as shown in figure 26.6. The five types are based on which volatile components are consumed or liberated as temperature increases. The first is dehydration reactions, such as the reaction in equation 26.5. Second is decarbonation reactions, such as the reaction in equation 26.6, both of which we just previously discussed. The third is the combined dehydration decarbonation reaction. An example of this would be mangosite plus talc equaling forced right plus free CO2 plus water. We'll discuss this more in just a few minutes. Prograde reactions are reactions that consume water and liberate CO2. An example of this would be mangosite plus quartz plus water equaling talc plus CO2. 
And finally, the fifth option is prograde reactions that consume CO2 but liberate H2O. An example of this would be zoocyte plus carbon dioxide equaling anerthite plus calcite plus free water. The typical shapes of each of these reaction types on the TX fluid diagram are illustrated in figure 26.6. The shapes make, make some sense when considered in the light of hydrous phases breaking down at very low XH2O and carbonates breaking down at very low XCO2. For example, a type 3 reaction of assemblage A includes both a hydrous phase and a carbonate phase. The hydrous phase breaks down towards the high concentration of CO2 and the associated carbonate is consumed by the reaction even though it would otherwise be stable. Similarly, the carbonate breaks down at high H2O, consuming the, the associated hydrous phases. There must be a thermal maximum to type 3 reactions in the TX fluid diagram. Any reaction that does not liberate or consume H2O or CO2 will not be affected by the composition of carbon dioxide and will form horizontal lines on the TX fluid diagram. Greenwood 1967 theoretically demonstrated that the location along the x-axis of the thermal maximum of the type 3 reactions will be determined by a stoichiometric coefficient of CO2 and H2O in the reaction. If equal molar quantities of CO2 and H2O are freed, Tmax will occur at a composition of CO2 equaling 0.5. In our example representing type 3 reactions, we have 5 moles of CO2 that are freed for each mole of H2O. Therefore, Tmax will be located at, at XCO2 equaling 0.83. So this concludes our discussion on metamorphic reactions for now. Hopefully this clarifies how crystallization in metamorphic environments works and clarifies how we have the different different grades of metamorphic rocks.